Are you ready to get funky with functions? Well, I hope so, because today we are going to be talking about functions. In a nutshell, we're going to learn the basics, the syntax of how they look, the keywords that we use, what they can do. Then we're going to talk about a very important concept related to functions, which is calling the function. How do you tell it to execute that code? How do you pass in variables? How do you get things back out of it? That's going to all be covered in the calling section. And then our final topic is going to be parameters, because there are stipulations that you can specify and some that are specified by Python as itself for what can go into a function and what can come out and how that looks. So we're going to learn about some of the styling that you can use when you're telling somebody else how to put a function in. We're going to talk about something called star args, which allows us to do lists. And then we're going to use something called star star quarks. So get ready to find out what all these funky words are about in this lesson. Functions. Funky functions, I mean. Let's go to funky town. Man, I wish I could afford that song. You know the rights to use it. You even know what song that is because of how bad I sing. Who knows? But listen, today we are here to learn about functions. So why do you think that a gas pump is what I chose for our mnemonic? You put X amount of dollars in and you can mathematically calculate what amount of gallons you're going to get out. So I like to think of functions as ratios, even though obviously they can have all sorts of logic. They don't have anything to do with ratios at the end of the day. But just to keep it in your head to start with, Think, all right, every $1 that I put into this gas pump, I am going to get one half of a gallon out. So if I put in $2, I get one gallon of gas. And we want to model that using a function. We would do a syntax that started with DEF for define or defining a function, short. And then we would give it a name using our normal naming conventions. We don't do camel case. We could, but we just conventionally don't. And we can't use dashes or the number one or a number here at the beginning. So we have gas pump. This looks good. And then we have an open and closed parentheses colon. Okay, This is just a syntax to get used to. And in here is where we're passing our variable. Now, this dollars can be anything. It's whatever variable we choose to make it. It can be that Captain Picard uh, UTF-8 icon I used before. It can be anything that Python understands, as long as we use it as a symbol to remember what we're using it for inside. So name this something that makes sense to what you're doing in here. Think of everything in here as something that's enclosed kind of in Tupperware. Different than our variable, because that just holds a state but an entire working machine, like a toaster. Think of a toaster with all of its little components, and they're all in here. Those components only interact inside the shell of the toaster. And here we take whatever is passed in. It could be $5, it could be $50, depends on how much gas you need for your car. And then it's going to multiply it by a half, by 0.5, and it's going to create a new variable gallons. Now, this gallons variable is stuck inside of the function. There's no way to get it out unless we explicitly ask for it using this keyword return. So we'll talk about that in a second. But let's just look at an example here. This is my function for a gas pump. It's going to give you half a gallon for each dollar you put in. So we're going to define how much cash we have. We have $14 in cash. And then we're going to pass it in. OK, this number 14, it could go right here also. We don't necessarily need it to be a variable. But just to show that you can, it will go in to here. It will process, and it will return whatever this gallon's total is. Are you ready to pump some gas? Done. Right? $14. We've got seven gallons of gas. And now our you know, fast motorcycle. Rebel without a cause, Harley Davidson is all, you know, full of gas and pumped up, ready to, to cruise the open road. So if we're going to be cruising the open road, we're probably going to need to make some calls. So why don't we talk about calling a function? Very punny, Dylan. Very punny. Ring, ring, ring. Hey, you're conscious here. Would you like a bowl full of melted contacts? Like contacts, like the kind that you would put in your eye, like a whole bowl full of them melted down? No? That sounds disgusting, gross, and memorable, doesn't it? That it does. Let's talk about calling a function. So we've defined this function here, cup of melted contacts. It's hard to say because it's not a real thing that anyone would ever do. 
and cream. Okay, so we're passing in to this function. I imagine, imagine like a cup of coffee, um, but we're passing in melted contacts instead of coffee, and then some cream, you know, probably to make it taste better. Blech. And we're going to return, instead of making the variable first and then returning the variable, we're just doing it all kind of in this shorthand notation. So we're just returning the sum of the two. So we have a function. Now, what do you think is going to happen when we run this? Nothing. Kind of, but kind of not. Actually, there is a function that was just defined, but functions are containers. They're like, con they're like toasters. They're, they're there, and they're ready to go, but until you stick that toast in them, they're not going to do anything. It looks like you plug in a toaster, and it looks like it doesn't work, right? Because you haven't put toast in and pressed the button down. That's the same way. So calling is essentially the same thing as putting toast in the toaster and pressing the button. So let's make a couple variables here. So we're going to melt down 64 contacts. Melt, you know, I hope you know what I mean. Like a contacts that people put in their eyes for good vision. I imagine like a bunch of them, 64 or 100 or whatever. And then you put them in a bowl, you put them in the microwave, and you just melt them into a liquid, okay? Because they're probably plastic or something weird like that. Okay, so that's what we have for our variables. Now, what do you think is going to happen when our function doesn't have any logic in it, except it just has this keyword pass? So we are passing in this number, 64, and we're also passing in this number, 4. What's going to happen? Nothing. Oops. So that's kind of weird. Now, that's a totally pointless function. But you might see something like this in code because you know you're going to need it later or kind of like a reminder that you're going to do something. But you know, in essence, this function that we've created called morning drink really has no use. So let's go ahead and start filling it in with some stuff that might actually do something. So what do you think is going to happen if we don't have a return, but we do have some logic inside? Well, following what we said before, it will process that. These two have been added together. But they didn't go anywhere. They didn't get returned. They didn't get put into a variable. So, you know, Python just got this fun this like toaster that's like, hey, I, I'm ready to be pressed. Now I have the mechanics inside of the toaster, and you can press the button and put toast in me, but you just haven't yet. Now this this is like a toaster that has nothing inside of it. This is like a toaster that just needs some toast. Um, so let's give it everything that it needs. Let's think of this return keyword as pressing that button and putting toast in our toaster. 68. All right, so what happened here? Let's just remind ourselves 64 and 4 are the two variables that we passed in. That makes sense. So 64 came in here, 4 came in here. What was pairs is now melted contacts. Okay, so that's important to keep. This is a variable of the number 64. And it just becomes this. Okay, these don't have to match up even though it seems kind of like like they kind of should. Like you you could go the extra mile and like make it so that this is also melted contacts and you define melted contacts as the variable. And that, that could be smart for your situation, but just important to know that this is totally separate. Okay, now that we see that it's working, let's make a point to separate these two concepts. So we have what I consider the Tupperware part up here, the logic, the container, the toaster. And then I have the part where you put the bread in down here. So we don't have to put them right next to each other. So in this case, the toaster analogy really breaks down. Like this is like almost like a light switch. Or if we could put the toast in the wall somewhere else, but the toaster was like on the other side of the room and then sent the heat over or something weird. But anyways, the point is that these two are totally separate. So you should think of this as being something that can be somewhere else in your code, right? Like put it way down here and you can run it and you still get the same response, okay? It just kind of magically travels through the air, and this is what makes it powerful, is that we can write all of these complex functions, and the functions can have functions inside of them, and they can call on others, and there's a huge stack of logic and all this amazing stuff your computer can do, and you just write something like here, like, you know, make me a morning drink, or, you know, move my mouse to the right, and it does all the logic to move all the other things and all the pixels around, and, you know, kind of the mind-boggling stuff is done separately, and it's contained in its own world. Okay, well, now we know that the function works, but you might ask yourself, how would I know if I didn't write the function myself, if you didn't have first-hand knowledge? Well, luckily, Python helps us with that, too, because there is a callable function that we can pass our function, or actually any other object, because everything's an object in Python, into to find out if it's callable or not. So here's an example, the tiniest, simplest function I can imagine. Actually, we can make it more. Let's call it A. The function A, we define it, we name it, we give it the parameters with no parent, we have parentheses for the parameters with no variables passed in, 
the colon to give the statement that it's over, and then pass. Now, it's kind of unique to have it up there. Usually you would see it down one block, but it actually works if it's just passed in this kind of shorthand notation. Um, so we have A. Can we run this? True or false? True, because it's a valid function, right? There it is, right in front of us. So we also can check other things. So we know we define morning drink. This should be callable too. Yep. And what about the number one, an integer? Well, an integer is not really callable in my head. It's not a function. It doesn't do anything. You can't pass anything into it. But who knows? Python's weird. Oh, we were correct. False. You cannot pass it in. And you might think a variable. All right, well, that's a container. It's got some stuff inside of it. Maybe that's callable. So let's find out if our two knees can be called. False. So it's easy to find out what's callable and what's not. But what's the syntax to actually make a call? Ring, ring, ring. Yellow. Would you accept a collect call from simple function? No parameters being passed in. It's a 3 times 4 return. Yes, yes, I will. Do you even know what I, you probably, probably don't even know what I'm saying there. It, it, collect calls. It's an old watch old movies, people. It's how peep it's how old people used to make calls. I guess or old poor people made calls. So here's the problem with the syntax. If you don't make the call with the parentheses on it, meaning that there could be parameters, even though in this case there's not, but you have to say I could be passing in some parameters. If you forget to do it, which is a really common mistake, you don't even really get an error. So you have to be kind of aware of it because it is just what it says it is. It's, it's a function. It's kind of like a variable, even though you never put it in a container. It's in this private place, dunder main, and it's dot simple. And then it sort of attached it to this behind the scenes method. Okay, so if you see this, just realize, oh, I forgot the parentheses. That's the only thing you need. Much better. Then you can call this, and it's actually going to process what's inside and do the return. So this is kind of like working with the Tupperware. This is like moving it around or looking at it. It's defined up here in sort of the same way a variable would be. But this is actually execute. This is do something. Like, go ahead and process that and give me your return. And this is also where we will be passing in things when we get to our parameter section. So quick touching on annotations. Annotations are not required. In other programming languages, you have to specify things like this, but you don't in Python. So if you want to specify, for the sake of clarity, that you want to pass in a parameter, and you want that parameter to be an integer, so don't pass me a string, you can actually use colon, kind of like a dictionary here. And you can say, all right, this is the variable. Remember, x is anything you want to name it, as long as you want to work with it in here. But you can say, I want it to be of type integer, or of type string, or of type float. And you can use this arrow here with a list to say, you will be getting back a list. Check this out. Shopping equals add. OK, this is a function. You can see it defined right there. And it's got the number 4. This is an integer. It's got a string which is going to correspond with string, and it's got 4.4, .4, which means it's a float. So it's going to give us a list in return, because we specified. So look down here. When we do shift tab, it gives us some information here, saying pass me in an integer, pass me in a string, pass me in a float. So that's really the power of it. When you're working with a team, they can see what you were expecting, or it gives them more clarity on what, what you need. And it's not going to throw an error if you give it the wrong thing. It's just going to work also. Or work or not work, depending on what the logic is. But it's not necessarily something that is enforced either. So keep that in mind. And you can see that the type we got back was a list, just like I said it would. OK, anyways, that's annotations. OK, enough about the topic of calling. Time to hang up on that topic, if you know what I mean. Very punny. Very punny, Dylan. Let's talk parameters. Very cool stuff. These are the things that we're passing into our functions to be processed. These are the dollars in the gas station example. So there's a few styles on how you can put them. Let's start with the most basic. We have a couple variables, bm here and ym, and they're just defined as these two numbers. And we have a function called hungry hippo. It's going to take in an x argument and a y argument. Remember, we name these and match them here. And it's going to subtract y from x. OK, so you know, what is it? Subtraction is not commutative. It's whatever the opposite of commutative is. So it has to be done in a specific way. 
So watch what happens. When we have a function and we call it with bm first, it's going to take 7 in the first argument, which is going to become x, which is going to make it 7. And then we are going to subtract y, which is going to be the ym argument, which is going to come in here and subtract there. So we're going to start with 7, and we're going to subtract y. Now, it will still work if we reverse it. But because the logic needs it in a certain order, we are going to get a different answer. We're going to get negative 4. So this is something to be careful of. Well, I mean, we can't just be passing in parameters like willy-nilly on this thing, you know? It's not going to know wh which order you want things in. So we have a few options. One, you can make sure that the order goes in correctly, always starting with the first argument, first argument, second argument, second argument. Or we can actually specify. So in cases like this where we need things to be in the correct order, we can be explicit about the variables we're passing in. So in this example, you'll see that we set y and x the same way we did up here. But in this case, we're saying y is equal to ym. And we make sure that the variable 3 that we have is in the variable named ym. When you do this, it will go the same no matter what order they're in. So watch this. For example, we're going to get out 4 here. And we also could rearrange this and still get out 4. So it's going to be invariant to the order that they're in, for lack of a better word. Now let's look at a new function where we have this equal sign on the opposite part. Instead of having it down here where we're calling, we're actually having it up here where the function is. So this is interesting. Do you think it does the same thing? Let's try. 5. All right, so I think you kind of get it just now that this is acting as a default argument. If we were to put in something else over the x, like 10, it will overwrite it. But if no arguments are passed in, it's going to default to 5. So this is a really powerful thing to do if you would get an error if no argument was passed in. But you know, sometimes they're going to be lazy, the user is going to be lazy or whatever, and you just want to make sure that something goes in and a 5 is a good default value. So x equals up here in the function is an automatic default position. So we can mix and match the two. I just kind of want to show you how you can have something that's required to be passed in, or you can have something that's required slash it has a default, so it's kind of optional in a sense. But it does need an argument. It's not optional to have an argument, but it's optional to pass it a new one because it's got a default state. So here's an example of that. We can pass it ym, get 3. Um, yeah, we're going to have a missing, missing error here. So the positional argument x is gone. This is referring to how we have passed in one argument, which is all that's really required from the mix and match. But it's not the right one, because we were so explicit about saying that ym is only going to replace this one that has the default. It's not going to work. But we could say it's x, and then we would have something that ran. So. What do you think about a triple threat? Nobody likes a triple threat. Double threats are terrible. Single threats are terrible. Triple threats are, oh, they're a home run. OK, got a function. First, second, and third are going to be the variables we pass in. And we're going to add them together to see where our runner goes. So we place the arguments in the function call with a comma between the two to separate them out. That makes it so that it's first, comma, first, the number one, then comma. So it's going to take all these together and add them up. And of course, we get 6. You already knew that. And that's it for style part of parameters. Now we're going to talk about args and quargs, the coolest words in Python. So what does passing in star args do? I will show you. It means that we can pass in something of varying length, whether it has two items or four items or 50 items, as many items as your memory can handle. By putting star args up here, it's going to take in the entire list of everything that you pass in. Another really powerful thing, if you have a function that just says, you know, process however much comes in. I don't need to know how many times a variable is going to come in. Just every time I see one, this is what I'm going to do. So do you think we can make some specific and some of the star arg style at, in the same function? Can we have some that are just like, I need these, and then the rest are like, and anything else you got. But I got to have these. Oh, yeah. Of course. That was really a setup question. Let's be honest. 
But here you can see we have first required, second required, third required, and then as many more as we want to pass in. So when we make the call, we have this star args up here. We have the first one, one tequila, it's got to go in. Second, two tequila goes in. Third tequila, and then floor plus the rest, car in jail. Hey, it's your decision. Let's talk star star quarks. Star star quarks, I just like saying it. Star star quarks. What do you think adding star star quarks will do to this function? Did you guess that? Cabbage equals vegetable? Well, what's happening here is we're able to not just pass in a long list. We're actually able to pass in pairs. So this creates a dictionary on the back end that we don't really see, and it's combining the two things as they come in and keeping them grouped together. So when something gets passed in as star star quarks, we can run this for loop. And remember before we talked about having an index and a value, a key and a value using this dot items method. Well, we can use that to actually see what's going on. We can pull a name and a value out of what's passed in through star star quarks. And we can put them in these positions, right? The first position is going to be the name. And then the second position is going to be the value from the string video. Remember, this equal sign is only a string of text. This could be like, hi, guys, or whatever. That's not an actual equal sign. That's just part of what I'm showing you because these two are connected together. And when they come in, they come in as apple equals a fruit. OK, so it's a string, like a tag that we're putting on top of it. And then we're passing in a real variable called cabbage. And we're saying, by the way, that's a vegetable. So we can throw in these little tags with it, which can help us when we get more complex logic inside of a function. OK, so let's just break this down from the top, because I'm not going to pretend it's really easy at the point we're at now. But it can be worked through. So we have a new function. We're defining it. Name bar makes sense. It's getting a first, second, and third argument. These are just single arguments. And then we're giving it this star star quarks, a special options that's going to be this kind of key value dictionary styled pair. Then we're closing out the definition and we're saying, here's the logic. Then we're going to make an if statement. So we're going back to our conditionals and we're saying, bring in this dictionary of stuff and get out the item action if it was passed in, which it was passed in down here. And we're saying, once you see what that is, if it's this and it's equal to this, then execute this logic, adding this, this, this together and printing it out. OK, so it's a little tricky, but when we call the function, we're passing in the first three parameters that are just singles. Then we have this pair here. Action comes with sum and then number comes with first. So we get. The sum is 6. Kind of makes sense. Keep thinking about it. Look it over. You can always download the notebook from my GitHub. And then I just want to show you kind of a fun ending. Let's talk about unpacking. It's just a really cool thing that you can save a ton of time doing when you really get your head around. Not totally necessary as a beginner, but just want to show it to you. We can make this function called alphabet, and we can bring in A, B, and C. You get the first three letters of the alphabet, and we do nothing but print them. So we can pass in. A dictionary, we can pass in a dictionary with two stars, or we can pass in a list with star. So star arg, star arg, and star star quark. Here is what happens. ABC, 1, 2, 3, and 10, 20, 30. So the first one, it's the dictionary. It has just a single star in front of it, which is just an arg, not a quark. But I also said that only the quarks were the dictionaries, right? So when it sees the dictionary come in, it just says, all right, there's only one star here, so it's an argument. Just use that argument, that argument, and that argument. And it just throws away the value, the value that's paired up with the key, and just uses the keys by itself. But when you pass in the star star quark, the dictionary then brings you the exact opposite. It only uses this as a label and brings you the value, the value, and the value. And then if you bring in a list, you just want to use a single, which makes sense because there's only one space. There's no colon and another key value pair. It's just a key or an item from a list. So kind of get your head around that. And you will understand how to pass things into functions, how useful it can be to store all that code. And you know, on the broader context, just how amazing functions are. A ton of layers of functions below what we have to deal with. And it's really amazing. It's what makes computers and all this magical tech stuff work. 
So that's it. We'll see you next time. Subscribe to our Mnemonic Academy YouTube channel for daily uploads that will help you learn amazing concepts through effortless associations.